My name is Jack Gems, and it's my pleasure to be hosting the discussion today with Leslie Jameson to talk about her incredible book, The Empathy Exams. Um, I think to start off, the first thing I wanted to ask about was um, the, the moment that you realized that this would be a book that could focus towards empathy. Did you know when you were starting to work on the essays that this was a through line through everything? Or can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so uh, well, first of all, it's really, really wonderful to be here. I'm excited to be talking to you. I'm so glad to be part of the festival. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's amazing to be here. Um, and yeah, I would say, no, I didn't, I, I didn't start writing the essays that are in this collection with an immediate eye towards these will one day be part of one book and that book will be about empathy. Um, I was writing, I mean, the, uh, the most honest answer is that I was working on a second novel that was not, <laughs> it was not working out very well. And uh, it was a, uh, it was actually different from the failed novel I was just describing to you before we turned our mics, but it was a it was a novel about the Sandinista Revolution in Nicaragua in 1979, and um, I, there was a lot of my heart in it. But I wasn't writing historical fiction is challenging in all sorts of ways that some of which I'd anticipated, others which I hadn't, um, and so I was really felt like I was hitting a wall with it, and started writing essays as kind of tiny escape hatches from the specter of that wall and. They were, you know, about all sorts of things. Some of them were attempts to document moments in my own experience. Others were, you know, I took a trip to Tennessee to witness this 125-mile ultramarathon that my brother was competing in and just basically taking everything into my pores and writing it down. And that was a very exciting new vision of what writing could be. I'd always been a fiction writer and had it had been me and my computer in a room or me in a library. And so kind of exploring the world in a more direct, active way just got really exciting. So I was writing, I was following my instincts on what pieces felt interesting to write. And it was really when I started working on a piece about my time working as a medical actor, uh, where I was, which then became the title essay of the collection, but um, where I was evaluating med students on how well they were empathizing with me, which is something we can talk more about. But um, I started to think explicitly about the ways in which empathy, understanding other people's experiences, making our own experiences legible, all of those had been questions that had been with me all along, running through all of these other disparate pieces. I just hadn't labeled them as such. That's great. So, um, so in thinking about that, essays as a response to a failed novel that you were working on, I was reading in um, an interview that you did at VQR, and you were talking about um, the enforced shame or taboo of the quasi-autobiographical <laughs> first novel, and was that it, it somehow fails to imagine far enough. Yeah. And so then, um, so then you took on this really ambitious project, and it, the the novel that you were looking for an escape from was about the Sandinista Revolution, right? right? Yeah. So, um, so I, I guess I'm interested in the idea of essays that incorporate the personal into them as an as a way or an antidote to a quasi autobiographical first novel. Yeah, no, it's a, it's it's wonderful to hear you frame the question that way because I think it's a really accurate constellation of these different things. I had written, you know, my my first novel was drawing on my own life in certain ways, in particular a, a situation in my family where there was a member of my family who had been estranged for a long time and I was writing a novel about a family that found itself in a similar situation. But yes, it did feel this kind of shame at having written so close to myself and the way that I you know, was in some way hearing voices or projecting voices saying, you're not as real an artist because you've drawn so much from your own life or your own experience. And so, yeah, I, I had this very back in a backlash response with my second novel where I was trying to go very far away and ventriloquize in this kind of radical way, which was hard. And I think part of what I loved about the form of the essay, or at least the kind of essays I started writing, was it I didn't feel forced to choose. Like I could write about my own experience and the experience of others in the same piece because I felt like if I was trying to answer a question, like what does it mean to empathize, 
both my own experience and things very far outside of me could potentially work as answers to that question or could supplement each other as answers to that question. So I didn't, I felt like the personal wasn't as shameful because it wasn't pushing away things that weren't me. And it was sort of like I found a way back to a kind of autobiographical writing that I had um, found myself resisting or feeling almost embarrassed by. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that there is um, some funny line that we're playing right now, at least in the receipt of literature, in that uh, so when you're writing fiction that's very, very close to yourself, there is that little bit of criticism that comes with it. But if you are writing nonfiction, somehow it's more acceptable. Yeah, well, you know, I think I, I think that there, I, to me at least, there can be a shame attached to personal memoiristic writing, even in even in non even in nonfiction and and I actually think it's it can come attached to gender in certain ways like I think when women write confessional material it's received quite differently often than when men write confessional material or seen as sort of another woman writing about the realm of the domestic and that's the woman's realm and um or the realm of the personal and I guess what I well I both wanted to certainly make a case and a defense for all the different and various things that memoiristic writing can be. But also I think it 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 was this chance to incorporate journalism and memoir into the same essay sometimes, certainly into the same book, and to kind of blend criticism and memoir into the same piece. And that somehow felt more possible for me in nonfiction, although I think there are one, people who do that wonderfully in in fiction as well, or like Ben Lerner's new novel, or right now I'm reading um, I Love Dick, Chris Krause's novel from the late 90s, which is a bit older, but is a, is an example of a book that I think really forcefully encounters that ta reckons with the taboo of writing about the self in a, in a really cool way. So, yeah, um, I love that book, that Chris <laughs> Krause book. Um, so then thinking about what you do pull into uh, the essays, and then what you also were working from with that first novel. I, I I noticed that in the essays and the empathy exams, you look a lot. You look pretty. You look very internally, and then pretty far away from yourself. And not you do bring into account uh, rom romantic relationships, but not so much family or friendships. Can you talk about how you make the decision of what to include and what you're willing to uh, share? Yeah, I mean, I think, at least with the essays in this collection, it really proceeded less from, here's an experience I had that I want to share with the world, and more like, here's a question that I'm interested in answering, and which of my own experiences feel relevant to answering that question. So if I was thinking about sentimentality or moments in my life when I found myself falling into an affect that felt like pure sweetness or pure happiness, the moments that were coming to mind for me were a few moments that I from romantic relationships in my past. So those were the ones I ended up invoking. Or when I was thinking about times in my life when I had felt consciously aware of a need for empathy from people close to me. I was also coming back to a particular relationship, the person I'd been with when I when I went through major surgery and thinking about, okay, what did I want from him in that moment? So it was more like those were the relationships that were rising to the surface of my mind as relevant. But I do think, I, I, I do spend a lot of time thinking about what I'm willing to, where I'm willing to go and, and where I want to draw the line. And it's, it's hard to speak generally about that because it does feel so different in each case. But I can say I've definitely pulled I've definitely pulled pieces uh, because they were upsetting to somebody who who they were about and that wasn't about my thinking it wasn't my right to tell that story or it would have been morally wrong of me to do so it was it was more just a trade off in my mind what ma what mattered to me more um and yeah I don't I don't write much about my family I mean it's interesting to me that the novel in certain ways is much more about my family than my my nonfiction has has ever been but um. I, I have I have written one piece about my family and that was a journey and it was actually it was it was certain parts of it were a hard journey but certain parts of it were also a really good journey. I mean I don't want to romanticize what it can mean to write about people who are close to you because sometimes it can be painful but sometimes they actually can open up conversations that wouldn't have happened otherwise and and that's been a really meaningful process too. Do you have a sense of why uh 
why this book has struck such a chord right now, why empathy is just really... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's funny because empathy seems, I mean, empathy seems like something that should never be in style or out of right. style. It just <laughs> is. Like, it's just like a, fa it's like a fact yeah. of our lives as human beings living alongside other human beings. That said, I have been confronted many times in the past six months with a, somebody saying, you know, that empathy is really like, you know, everything from like empathy is really hot right now, like whatever that might mean <laughs> to, you know, like, oh, you know, Obama famously was talking about empathy and um, or or sort of empathy seems particularly relevant to, I, you know, so it does feel like that subject is in the air and whether it's just now become a kind of snowball effect of people think empathy is big so they're thinking about empathy more but I guess the one thing I can say that might be kind of singular about the era that we're in is just the way that internet culture is kind of increasingly contouring how we relate to each other and I do think that there's a kind of connectivity that is possible over social media, over email, like th this way that we can kind of be touching base with each other, witnessing each other's lives um, more rapidly and and maybe uh, broadly than ever before. But there's a kind of, there can be a kind of hollowness or a limit to, you know, you can express so many things to people, but it's like an expression happening in 140 characters or something like that. And I was teaching a an essay writing course at Yale the spring of the um, Boston Marathon bombing, and I had a number of students who wanted to write essays about their frustration with Twitter sympathy. Like it was it was interesting to me how many of them arrived at this similar versions of a kind of singular subject, but they there was this kind of flooding of sentiment happening over the you know, the Twitter sphere that was upsetting to them because it felt false or it felt like it wasn't, I guess it wasn't, it felt false because it wasn't backed up by effort or labor. And so it, it was, but it, there was something in that that got me thinking about, well, we live in this era where it's very possible to express all these feelings, but they're not necessarily entailing very many commitments and that maybe that's putting forth the question of empathy in a different, in a different way or challenging us to think about what it actually means to have a feeling towards anybody or whether there's any good in just having a feeling. Yeah, that gets towards something that I was hoping to talk about, the, the dangers of empathy. So um, the idea that uh, is empathy enough, you know, is uh, because of the title of the program, I thought we should bring up at least once Susan Tont Sontag's <laughs> regarding the pain of others. <laughs> but, um, but she talks about... Um, that you know that book is mostly about war photography and um she talks about whether um it's right to look at images of suffering and whether we shouldn't be limiting who looks at images of extreme suffering like that to people that can either help or can learn from looking at the image and you know countering trying to figure out who can learn from an image is very difficult because ostensibly all of us can but the the question then becomes uh what will you do beyond looking right 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 no it's a, it's a fantastic question and I, yeah well i have a few different things that i could say about it but what the way that you phrased it what it's bringing to mind right now is actually this um assignment that i was working on just this past summer where you know, it's funny because I haven't actually worked on the pieces that were in this book since the summer of 2012, but it also feels like, like my editor was joking that my next book would just be like more empathy exams <laughs> because it seems to be the only thing I ever write about anyway. But um, I was working on a piece for a um, travel magazine called Afar that's, uh, I think, geared towards like a fairly wealthy traveling clientele. And they have a, I don't, it's not, I don't typically write for that kind of magazine, but um they have a feature called Spin the Globe where they choose a destination at random, or as they say it's random, and then you get, you commit like a week of your life, and then they tell you 24 hours in advance. They send you your itinerary. So you don't know where you're going until right before you go there. And they sent me at the end of August to Sri Lanka, and it was, it was incredible to see Sri Lanka because it, it was an exciting and very far away place to be going. But I also was immediately plunged into a whole set of feelings about going somewhere, essentially as a professional tourist, uh, a place 
where there was, you know, such intense civic violence that, you know, their civil war only ended in 2009. And to go, what, what was my role going to be as a traveler there? You know I mean? So may, the civil war ended in 2009 and they were voted in 2010 by the New York Times as like the world's best travel destination or something like that. I mean, it's really, I mean, there's like an incredible cognitive dissonance in the various ways that um, Sri Lanka is, is perceived, I think. And, and I was talking to a few of my friends who are um, Sri Lankan journalists and thinking about how to put together this week-long trip there on very short notice. And it eventually came down, it felt like it was coming down to this choice between was I going to stay in the south, which is really where the tourist industry is concentrated, or was I going to try to go north, where there's not really an infrastructure and it, it's kind of hard to even get there. But but that's, you know, that's where the civil war happened and, and where there's a certain kind of history that people aren't seeing. All this is a very long way of answering the question of like, what good does it just do to see? Because I did end up going to the North and and ended up being really kind of overwhelmed by a lot of what I saw there. There was a lot of um, damage that was still very, very visible. And, but I started to think about, well, what, I've seen this and I'm gonna write about this, but it, there's nothing inherently I kind of wanted a gold star for it because it had, you know, been much more uncomfortable to take that journey. But there, w w what did I deserve my gold star for? Because was it an intrinsically good thing just to be witnessing it? And and I think it gets this issue of who's going to learn from the image or, sh you know, who can possibly learn because I started to kind of valorize this sense of almost like Trojan horse style sneaking in that people open their, you know, wealthy travel magazine and that they were going to have to read my piece about the Sri Lankan civil war. And that I was thinking well, maybe there would be something valuable in forcing people into that discomfort or dissonance. Um, but I didn't, I didn't end up, I mean, I, what I ended up doing was writing a piece that was like three times the <laughs> word limit and wasn't at all, I think, what they were looking for. Um, and, but it, I was really thinking about, you know, I, I think that there can be a value to the simple fact of exposure when it's exposing people to a history or a story that they haven't encountered before. But I also think it's so important to think about the conditions under which knowing or being asked to imagine somebody else's experience should just be a catalyst rather than a destination. Like it should be the first step in some ongoing process rather than a closed circuit where it's like, okay, you felt the thing, now we're, we're all done. Like. Yeah, that reminds me of um, in your essay about the Joan Didion, Joan Didion in um, El Salvador, mm -hmm. how uh, how there's all this uh, calamity going on, uh, just sort of you know miles from where she is, but she's in a, a, a convenience store and she's just looking at the absurd things that are being sold in this convenience store. And um, I love the way that you put this. The um, Irony, or, irony is easier than hopeless silence, but braver than flight. The problem is that sometimes your finger shakes as you gesture. There's no point to point to, and maybe you can't point anywhere, or at least not at anything visible. And I just really love the idea that, yeah, just putting your pl yourself in that position and then just so the bewilderment of looking for the thing that you can point to mm -hmm. when you're out of mm -hmm. uh, your element there yeah. is is a very strong gesture in its own right. Yeah, I mean, and I think, um, I, you know, for me sometimes it feels less like choosing to make a strong gesture and more just like this is the only gesture I'm capable of because anything else would be dishonest. The unshaking finger would be dishonest. Or I, one of the reviews that of, of the book that I really like, I mean, it's gotten a lot of reviews that I was like really honored by and and respected the intelligence behind the the review but uh, the review in slate talks about it was kind of quoting how other reviews had described the book as unflinching and then it said you know I actually really like the ways in which this book flinches or it seems like it kind of moves back and forth between flinching and unflinching and I that wasn't ever a language or a framework I thought of but it felt really right to me I was like I do think I'm kind of trying to document the flinch in a lot of places which I feel like is another version of the shaking yeah the, the finger that shakes as it points um, I, I feel like a lot of the reviews of the book often focus on, um, well, there's a few essays that tend to get pulled out the most, but one of them is the essay about Morgellons, The Devil's Bait. And, um, and uh, well, I, I don't want to talk too much without explaining a little bit of it. Would you mind? Yeah, yeah sure. In, in so case people haven't read it. Yeah. Um, 
Morgellons disease. I love to talk about Morgellons disease right before a meal time. <laughs> it's like the perfect. It's a little. There's something a little bit disquieting about it, but um, it's a. Uh, as a controversial skin disorder where pa- people who self-report as having Morgellons disease will report a wide variety of symptoms that include things like um, lesions and itching and formication, which is like the sensation of insects under the skin. But the biggest, most remarkable symptom that they report is basically unexplainable fibers coming up through their skin, kind of emerging from their bodies. And... Um, there's a fairly large, I mean, there's like about 12,000 people who report as having the disease. And mostly when they would go to see doctors, they wouldn't get a lot of, uh, you know, it was, it was treated more as a kind of psychosomatic or delusional condition. But there were enough of them kind of agitating enough that the CDC conducted this three-year investigation that concluded, I think, in 2010 or 2011. And um, so I, I went to a conference that they... The Morgellons community has an annual conference in Austin every spring. And I went to that conference less interested in figuring out, is it real? Are the fibers real? And more interested in seeing what that community was like and what they got out of gathering together. So I think that what um, I, I just think about that essay all the time since I read it the first time. And um, and I think that the thing that really just I, I catch on every time is um, that you would be talking to someone who's suffering from Morgellons and um, and providing them empathy, you know, nodding along and saying, yes, I understand. Um, but the, the thing that you're nodding along to in a lot of ways is the pain caused by whatever it is that Morgellons is. But their understanding of uh, the cause is different than yours. But uh, And they might think that you're nodding along with the cause, right. but you're really uh, nodding along with the effect. Uh, can you talk more? It seems problematic, you know, to or not... Um, I mean, obviously, it's kind to uh, provide someone uh, connection and, and listen to them. But, uh, but to say, y- yes, I agree, but for there to be a disconnect between what it is you're agreeing to. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, that was really one of the cores of that essay for me. And I, I mean, I think the dilemma of nodding along is like one of the great character struggles of my whole life because I'm a pleaser and I, and I like to make people feel good and I like to give them the response that I think is going to make, I like to give them the response they want or the response that I think is going to make them feel good. And if somebody's describing a painful experience, often what they want is for you to hear it and affirm that you see kind of the pain of it. And I think that I was really, well, when I was asking myself, what is, what am I actually communicating when I nod? And am I communicating something that's essentially a lie? Like, am I saying I believe you when really I don't necessarily believe there are actually fibers coming out of their skin? <clears throat> One of the bigger questions that that led me to the kind of interrogation of the nod was like, wh- um, what does it mean to have empathy for somebody if you believe in the fact of their feeling but not where disagree with them about where it's coming from? Does that still count as empathy or what kind of gymnastics do you go through to experience that sort of empathy? Um, And then I think some of the other questions that that led me to were really about my own practice as a journalist and kind of how to quiet the part of myself as a journalist that always wanted to be making somebody feel good or always wanted to kind of give them the sense that I was on board for their version of their own story when really maybe I was going to tell a very different version of their story. And, I, and I'm and i not the first, I mean, Jenna Malcolm's The Journalist and the Murder is like a kind of classic dramatization of that journalistic dilemma. But I was kind of coming into my own experience of that dilemma when I was writing that piece. So, yeah. And that makes me think of um, the idea of uh, a person performing their pain then too and uh, w- when you're deciding if you uh, can offer empathy in an instance like that, I, I f- uh, it must sound like a leap, but in my mind, it, it makes sense because um, you're questioning what uh, what you're portraying as your empathy, and then a person who uh, who might be acting out in a way that uh, that is requesting attention and uh, and empathy. You know, is that as valid? Uh, 
a need as someone who might truly be in pain, which I think is a very hard line to draw, you know, because if they're acting out their pain, then the pain is real, right? Yeah, well, and I, and I, yeah, I do think, and it's interesting that phrasing, because I feel like that connects in certain ways, though, my experience with the Morgellons community to some of the stuff I talk about in the final essay in the yeah. book, but um, one of the topics that I look at in the last essay in the book is um, – cutting, self-harm, and n not only trying to think about what um, might motivate cutting, but also how cutting is perceived, and in particular, the kind of way that there's a, I, I do think there's a certain shame that get, you know, girls or women who cut get shamed because they think it's seen as a cry for attention, and that I think sometimes there is an attempt to distinguish performed pain from actual pain, and I very much agree with you that not only do I think it can be a, a close to impossible line to draw, but I also question why we want to draw it. Like, who are, who, what, what category, who are we sorting into these categories, and why do we want to deny some of them attention or sympathy? Why is it wrong to be asking for attention, you know, and isn't, isn't the ask itself proof enough of something? And so I think there was a, a real, in a, in a few of the different essays, there, it, it comes back to a, a, a resistance, I feel, to, to certain sorts of schemas or, or hierarchies between like kind of legitimate and illegitimate pain. And then sort of as counterpoint in that same essay that you just referenced, I uh, was very interested in your talking about uh, post-woundedness and how there's sort of a, a backlash against uh, the emo kids uh, performing this sadness. And, and now there's this, uh, this air of stoicism that people put off or, or they can, they, can mention that something that they're going through, but they don't want, uh, they're, they try to brush it off. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I mean, is it, you know, is this just like a never ending cycle then that we're going to go through? Or, I, you know, I think like, and specifically women in that essay talking about how women uh, have experienced the negative reaction to them showing their pain. And so they, they try to erase it as much as possible. Yeah, well, the uh, the last essay was in certain ways really the hardest. I was like, I'm going to close my eyes when I remember writing it because it was in certain ways it was the hardest one to write because I really felt like I, I felt very strongly that there was something I wanted to write about, which was this sense of shame at expressing a certain amount of pain and how maybe that shame was gendered. And I felt in a couple contexts, and one was the context actually of the book itself because I had written – Everything else in the book, I knew that I was writing what was going to be the last essay. And part of what I felt like I was writing about or writing towards was this hypothetical reader I kept imagining um, who was saying, you know, why why do you keep talking about these thing, hard things that happened to you? Like they weren't even that hard or they weren't even that big of a deal, but you keep harping about them. And it was a really powerful voice in my head. I mean, it's been interesting to have the book come out because it's a voice that's now been actualized, not all the time, but many, many people who read the book or reviewers say some version of that. And it's been interesting to hear it kind of, to really hear it spoken. But at that point, it was just like a fear in my head. And I, and I realized that it was something I'd felt a lot through my whole life was like, don't, you know, don't get, don't indulge in self-pity, don't wallow. Um, and it was something that a lot of friends I had who were female, I'd heard a lot of other women in my life articulate it, but it was very nebulous. Like I was like, I, there's this feeling I have, I want to somehow articulate it. I want to speak back against what this voice is, but I was also like, wh wh who is saying, like, am I just building an argument against a straw man? Like, is this voice of shame actually out there? So that was an interesting part of the essay was trying to find an articulation of this thing I was fighting against because I think at a certain point it just becomes very internalized. So it's less that you can find the shamer and more that you just see the residue of it in all of these, like my psyche and the psyche of many women I knew and loved. And so constructing the essay was, yeah, it was a real process of kind of identifying what it was that I thought I was speaking against. And then I guess to get to that question of is it like a never ending cycle, I think part of what I really ended up looking for in that essay was where are instances where I feel like 
I can find female expressions of pain and also in, in literature, like in novels and memoir and songs um, that actually do something more than just wallow in the pain, but actually seem to be transforming or like opening up into some other space beyond the pain. So it was kind of look, trying to not just be resisting a shaming, but posing some kind of alternative of like, this is a representation of female pain that's not just reifying the woman in a position of victimhood is like doing something else. Um, so there was really a try, an attempt to open out into a positive, like this is something I can stand behind, not just this is what I'm arguing against. Um, yeah, I like that idea that uh, th you talk about just listening to a song over and over to keep yourself in this one emotional moment. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> in... Uh, in thinking about the ways that uh, reading essays or fiction uh, or even watching movies, which you've talked about a little bit before, I know, um, it, it can provide this uh, manufactured way of, uh, of dropping into someone else's world and letting you feel all of these other feelings that you don't uh, normally have access to. And is there... Um, like, is there a danger in that, in that you might be avoiding dealing with something that's uh, that's with you? Like, you, you're you're giving yourself this gift of these other people's emotions or experiences rather than uh, sitting quietly with yourself. Right. Yeah. Well. It, yeah, it's an interesting question because it makes me think about a couple things. It actually makes me think about um, what Tanya was saying in her like very lovely introduction about the way that connecting to our own pain might give us a way to open into the pain of other people or connect to the pain of other people. And I think the, the flip side can work too. Like I think some, sometimes encountering the pain of others, even in these kind of structured or very aestheticized ways, can actually give us a new kind of self-relation. And that's certainly been a powerful experience for me as a, as a reader and a listener and a watcher. And as always part of why I wanted to write is like I've had these uh, powerful experiences as a reader and the idea that I could give some version of that to somebody else as a writer. So I think sometimes it's, it, it's not that encountering other people's pain and a work of art substitutes for looking at your own. It can, it can actually lead you back into your own but I guess the other thing I, I that what you said made me think about was um, the way that having empathy for a, char a character or a figure that you encounter in a work of art, a novel, a, a piece of journalism, a, a song, whatever, is a it's a kind of zero gravity empathetic experience because you're feeling something towards that person, especially in a novel. And there's a great um, a literary critic named Suzanne Keen wrote a book called Empathy in the Novel that was very useful to me because it challenges a lot of our notions about reading makes us more empathetic, et cetera, et cetera, these, which are kind of cultural truisms or in certain circles at this point. And um, she's sort of saying, well, having empathy for people who don't exist is actually a really gratifying kind of empathy to have because you don't have to do anything for them. You just feel, you're like, <laughs> okay, I feel sad for you or happy for you, but you don't exist, so I'm not obligated to you in any way. And so I think that can be another kind of peril of of feeling towards like artifactual creatures basically yeah um so, so circling back to um to what i forget who you said said it to you but will, what will you just more empathy exams right, what editor, will you yeah. On next? Yeah. yeah so um so i guess my question is does it feel like something that you can leave behind at this point? Or is it something that you feel like you need to keep pursuing because you're so deep in it now? Well, I mean, I, I, I don't think I need to keep writing with empathy as my explicit thematic umbrella and, and nor northern light. And or to something. be fair, I don't think that all of the essays in this book are just about empathy. Well, but yeah, but I think but you I can mean, trace I, it. Yeah. And I think I think in a way I'll never leave empathy behind because, and this gets back to what I was saying earlier, but it's kind of always with it. It's like it's like everything is about empathy. I mean, not not everything, but uh, the human for most condition. things I'm interested yeah. in that have to do with like it, human interaction or relation in some way, like they they connect back to it. But I have I found myself I have found my writing evolving in certain ways, and I guess one thing I can say is a lot of my most intense projects over the past year or 
maybe, yeah, two years have been much more um, journalistic, like much more intensely journalistic. And um, and in that sense, that's it's less of a, I think I'm driven as much by an interest in a certain kind of process as an interest in a certain kind of theme or subject. Um, and certainly some of those pieces are really two main pieces, but uh, they, they could connect back to empathy, but it really is this kind of thinking through how am I getting closer to other people's stories? What's my kind of methodology around getting closer to their stories? Like those have been some of the things that I've found myself really um, interested in. And I've also been doing for my next book project a lot of archival research and that brings its own set of psychological dimensions and I do think at least when I go to the archives I'm bringing a lot of baggage with me to the archives and I'm interested in what that baggage looks like but it's a it's again a kind of interest in a certain sort of a process and a kind of a new sort of process for me so um are you willing to talk about that project a little bit yeah so well the my next book is about addiction narratives and uh, it's a it's it's part memoir and it's part cultural history and it's it's interested in how we tell stories about addiction both uh, to help ourselves and other people get better and also to make beauty to make art and so thinking about the kinds of stories told in recovery and recovery communities and the kinds of stories told to become novels and memoirs and how are those stories shaped differently how do people kind of direct their story differently towards um, therapeutic ends and artistic ends and um so w what i and it's it's drawing a lot on my dissertation at yale which i've been working on for the past four years which is about uh, a little bit of a history of recovery institutions and various authors who've engaged with them um but i'm just interested in kind of making an echo chamber of stories my own story one of those stories but just only one of those stories and thinking about the other voices in that chamber being voices coming up out of the archives and also voices um, that I've encountered as a reporter and um, trying. And it sounds great to say echo chamber, maybe it doesn't, but <laughs> in my mind it sounds easy to say echo chamber and then I think, oh my God, what's this? what is the structure of that echo chamber? How does that echo chamber <laughs> appear across a series of sequential pages? And and there are, quest there are big questions there that I still have to answer, but that that's what the project is. So. Yeah, as a writer, um, thinking about the way that you approach structuring, uh, you know, the essay is a very complete, compact, complete uh, entity in its own right. And then I, I feel like a, a book length uh, work of nonfiction, there's so much more room to explore and to figure out how you want to format it. So how has that process been? Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh yeah, so much more room. It's great. It's like in terms of possibility rather than than struggle, um, which I like. So, yeah, I think one big thing that I've been thinking about is the way that in the course of an essay, I think you can ask a reader to follow the motion of associative thought for the space of say twenty pages, and that that can be kind of compelling, and they're with you, and they're you know they're, they're tracking it. But I think with the with a whole book. I, I think I am going to end up relying much more on narrative than I than I usually do in my essays because I think, you know, narrative has become important to us for a reason, which is that one of the stories are compelling. Following a story is compelling. And so I think that in terms of thinking about the spine of the book, I'm, I probably am going to rely more on narrative propulsion and narrative momentum and, you know, probably my story is the source of some of that momentum. But, like, balancing these sort of associative leaps that I love and that feel honest and true to how things play out in my mind, but but also trying to think about, you know, being on a journey with the reader and not the kind of endlessly digressive texture of some books, even books where I really love the sensibility. I, I feel myself getting a little bit exhausted or a little bit zoned out. And um, so I'm trying to think about how to create a book that has that like tautness and and urgency alongside these various mental excursions. So, yeah, yeah, it's great that you said that because I was thinking about um, the term you used, uh, associative glue. I had read in an interview, I think, and how um, and how you can sort of uh, you come through in the essay that way because it's it's you that's at the root of everything that you're looking to explore and pull in. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. I'm very excited to read what comes next. Um, and I think with that, we uh, will open up the room to questions for the last 10 or 15 minutes. We've got Tiffany coming around with the mic. 
Thank you so much. Um, it's been wonderful. And uh, I'm a medical student, so everything that you wrote about with the, your main essay um, is really interesting because I've been on the other side of that. Yeah. Um, my question is kind of about how the questions that you ask um, or the way that you respond to someone's narrative of pain shapes that other person's interpretation of their story. Because um, I think when I first think of empathy, I think of you know someone has a set story and you're trying to relate to it. But I think there's something about the interaction that also changes how they saw that whole story. And I'm wondering, yeah, just if you could speak to that. Like, yeah, it's such a, it's such a, in a way, I think like the question is probably more beautiful than any response I could give to it. Because I do, I, I do think it's such a, a wonderful question. I mean, I guess I would say. Yeah, I, I do think you're right that that process of it, uh, that my relationship to my own life or anybody's relationship to their narrative is kind of co constantly in flux so that the, their sense of their own story is always evolving and it's and it's partially evolving due to whoever they're telling the story to and then maybe that there's like a feedback loop. Um, and it's partially evolving. And I think there's a kind of internal dialogue that starts as soon as we experience something that's then like shaping and deforming our memory of it. And I've been really, one of the things that has been so interesting to me about starting to work a bit more as a journalist is like, you know, I'll realize that I'm starting to tell myself the story of an interaction that happened between me and a subject as soon as the conversation is done. And I'll, so even like two hours after the conversation, I'll be sure they said, you know, I, um, I, I never really... I never really understood my mother or something, and, and that because it takes on the sheen of fact in my mind. But when I replay the tape, it's like they'll say, I, "I, you know, that year I never understood my mother. I never stood, understood that part of my mother." I'll, I'll realize how much I've already begun to like sculpt it into something other than what it was. Um, so I guess all I can say is, you know, with 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 certain subjects that I've had a more enduring relationship with, I have been able to see the ways that maybe their representation of their story the third time we talk is slightly different than it was the first time we talk. And I honestly can't know how much of that is because something about the way I was interested in their story was kind of magnetizing or drawing out certain facets of it or whether it was just kind of starting to tell the story more had had given them a a new or sharpened relationship to it and they were becoming interested in certain parts of their own story and drawing out more. But just I do... I do really try to remain sensitive to the ways that happens and to think about it less as an obstacle, like, you know, it's unreli unreliable or something, and more as, like, a zone of possibility. Like, what, what do all these shape-shifting narrative pieces mean? Uh, thank you. This is all very, very interesting. Uh, I've, been, uh, I've been thinking about your book a lot in the last several weeks in terms of the National Nervous Breakdown around Ebola and a complete failure to experience appropriate empathy or to regard as heroic the behavior of people who are suddenly denied <laughs> for having come back with Ebola or, or the whole kind of craziness that just happened with anybody who has the nerve to go and help other people over there has to be put in 24 day, 21 day quarantine when they come back and what kind of horrible thing are they to be coming back. It's, has, has it struck you as weird? What's going on? No, it's so. I was. I was literally. I was just thinking about this in my um, cab cab rides in my hotel yesterday because I was reading a bit about Craig Spencer and and the sort of you know it's it's kind of like New York has a particular reaction to things when they happen to New York. Like now it's okay. Now it's real because it's reached us. But there was a. I mean, it it yeah, it did. It did strike me as so unfortunate and almost absurd the way that you know, there would be this meticulous tracking of like which trains would he take to get home home to Harlem and stuff and no no recognition of like what what it would take for this man to be brave enough to go spend a month working with, you know, Doctors Without Borders and um and I, I, I do think I mean it's funny because sometimes you sometimes one of the perils of empathy seems to be that it's actually easier to empathize with one individual than an entire you know, aggregate suffering body or, su or suffering group, especially when that individual is somehow like more like you. Um, 
And so in a way that you could imagine a version of the world in which actually the problem was that Craig Spencer was getting way more empathy than thousands of people in Africa. But instead, it actually seems like we're not even good enough to fail empathy in that way. We're instead failing at an even lower level, which is like only caring about whether we ride the same subway trains as 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 him or not. Um, and also just the way that, you know, reading all those all the early accounts of the Dallas victims, it was always really hard to even get, I was aware in my own mind, and I guess I should also confess, I I, I did like read which cafes he'd eaten at, you know, because there's still a part of me that's like, oh, I wonder whether I ate at the same cafe as he did last week. Um, but I tried to trump that with another kind of voice in my head. But I was, you know, I was aware that when I would read those early newspaper accounts, I was always kind of curious, well, like, what's the state of this person? Like, are they, hel- are they, recovering? Are they being treated? Like, and that was always like buried really deep underneath like who they had possibly infected. And I would just say, you know, and I, I probably a lot of people here in this room are already thinking about this book, but it brought to mind Eula Biss's new book on immunity, because I feel like one of her powerful arguments in that book is that we need to think about ourselves not just as potential victims, but as potential agents of harm and it seemed like part of what happens in the response to Ebola is just like immediately being locked in understanding yourself as a potential victim and it, yeah. Hi. Um, have, have you had instances where because maybe people know that you're open to listening to their pain or their experience that they have taken advantage? Because there, I mean, I, I know everybody, I've had this happen many times where there are people that sense an openness and an opening, and they get in there and they, they mess with you. <laughs> <laughs> Is that an invitation? Yeah, um, I think well, it's you know it's it's a good it's a good question. I think it also gets to the importance of bo- boundaries, I guess, and the way that boundaries are really Im- important to empathizing too, in terms of. Um, I guess both setting up boundaries around yourself as a potential empathizer, but also understanding like something that was really powerful to me to hear was early on with the book, I I went to speak to a group of uh, mental health care practitioners in Danbury, Connecticut, who worked at an outpatient clinic that was essentially like the place that people went to when they couldn't get care anywhere else. And, you know, people the kind of people that other people would cross the street to get away from, you know, and um, that one of the things that that came up, I mean, it really ended up being more of a conversation with these, because I was sort of felt very strongly they had as much to teach me about empathy as I had to teach them, but that the importance of kind of not just trying to get right up close to somebody's pain right away to kind of respect the therapeutic process for them and and to say like, look, it's, there's also a real, there's a sanctity of privacy around pain as well, that it's not just doing good for somebody to try to immediately feel everything that they're going through and that respecting that kind of process and gradations in that process was really important and and I just I found that powerful to hear um in terms of my own experience like I guess I would say that one of the things that I've been really struck by since this book has come out in the world is the number of people who have wanted to share their story with me and uh, mainly over like email and social media and things like that. And and often it's connected to some sort of idea that comes up in the book. Like, you know, um, here is the way that I, I feel like my pain was dismissed or it was powerful the way you tried to account for the way that pain gets dismissed. Like, here is my experience with that. And I both found that, I mean, I was overwhelmed and like, I just felt that, I, I felt that something tremendous and something that I was tremendously honored by was happening when people were sharing their stories. But I also felt a constant sense of guilt about it, like a a constant sense of guilt about every, like every email I wasn't responding to basically. And, um, and because I felt like in a way the book was opening these conversations that it, that I, I wasn't prepared to follow through on. And so I think I kind of had to make my own peace with that and seeing the book not as an invitation to conversation, but just an offering in its own right. Um, but yeah, all of, I mean, there was a whole territory there that I, I hadn't thought through before it happened and that I've been doing a lot of thinking about since. So. Hi, uh, one, thing that really, one thing that really struck me um, 
was your um, essay on the saccharin and how not just as a writer but in your personal life um, and having a relationship with another writer that there was sort of a, a tendency to make really personal and deeply felt emotions very oblique, especially when you wrote about them or communicated them to the person you were in a relationship with. And I was wondering, if you are including things that are very personal to you, do you still feel that internal resistance to be um, to sort of censor yourself almost in, ha in the way you write about something that's very personal to you? Yeah, I mean, I think that I, you know, it's a great question. And I think I feel it, I think I feel it less than I used to. I mean, I think that the the kind of era of my life that I talk about in that essay is one where I was, I felt very scared of representing feeling directly in my writing, and so I didn't. And I and I was in a relationship with somebody who I think also felt resistant to representing feeling, and his response to that was to kind of construct these elaborate metaphors. And I was interested in how metaphor became a kind of obstacle or a sort of buttressing. I think that now what I feel is less a need to um, make all feeling oblique or opaque um, and, and, and more a, a kind of, I guess, a desire to understand my own private experience in con conversation with other people's experiences. And, and I, think that, but I think that that desire to put myself in conversation with others is just another way of addressing the same anxiety that made me kind of want to make it really opaque in the first place because it's like this, I think it's like the shame of narcissism or self-absorption or something. And one way to respond to the shame of self-absorption is kind of not to talk about yourself or your feelings that directly and and one another way to respond to the shame of self-absorption is to try to be interested in yourself alongside other stuff you know and uh, to put it sort of bluntly but um I, one more thing that I'll just say is that the title essay of the collection in which I end up talking about my own experience quite a bit um was initially one where I was really I was writing about being a medical actor and in early drafts, I was sort of vaguely referencing different things that had happened to me, but not really going into them. And one of my mentors read that draft and said, you know, it seems like you're really, it's very unsatisfying how you treat your own experience because it seems like you're sort of darting up to stuff and then darting away from it. And it, it's, it's, there's a feeling of like recoiling and it's, it's, it's just, it feels broken. It's not working. And, um, and he said it's almost like you're treating your own experiences with the same kind of clinical remove as somebody writing a script for a, a, a you know for a medical actor to practice on and for him it was just sort of speaking offhand to talk about this way that I had this kind of detached relationship to my own experience but it ended up making me think about structurally well what if I actually did turn my own experience into a script and that was what and that is what I ended up doing. And the structure of the essay does include pieces of my own life kind of written as scripts. And there was something about coming at deeply personal material through a kind of structural innovation that made it easier for me to talk about. So when you asked your question, I was thinking, like, maybe there is a kind of obliqueness in that because I needed to kind of ambush my own personal life from the side in order to articulate it for that piece. We'll take our last question over here. And I do want to remind you all that all book signings will be on the first floor in the lobby of the performance hall. Thank you. I, I've enjoyed this very much. Um, I think that your book, which I look forward to reading your collection of essays, you know, deals with pain, um, as what empathy is about. And we spend our lives uh, avoiding pain ourselves. And in some ways, I think avoiding maybe the pain of others because we don't know where to put that. And that's what empathy, I think, is about. Um, and I was wondering, in the process of thinking this and the time you've devoted to it, if you've come any closer to figuring out, either personally or in a larger sense, why pain? Why? What is the purpose of pain? Or why do we think that pain exists? Wow, that's like an <laughs> amazing final question. Um, I, I do I think it's a great I think it's a great question I mean I think I guess I mean I think one one place my mind is going in response to that question is has to do with kind of thinking about 
the biological functions of pain and how pain is alerting us to something being wrong that we need to address. And so there's something very adaptive about that kind of pain. And thinking about kind of how, I mean, the, in the more interpersonal context that I think about pain in thinking about how sometimes like our own pain is what enables us to ask for, or what's kind of puts a sense of urgency around our asking for something from another person, asking them to listen to our story or witness our experience in some way. And so I think in thinking about the purposes of pain, I think insofar as it kind of prompts us towards certain kinds of expression or can prompt us towards certain kinds of expression or certain kinds of connection, I, I think there is a purpose there. But, but I also want to leave a big door open on the other side of that question because I think it's a pretty infinite one. So thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. That was a wonderful conversation. Oh. Thank you for your questions. Thank you.